Hello, hello. Hello. So, um, I don't know how good I'm going to be today. I got about one hour of sleep last night, but I'm going to try to soldier through it. If I stutter, don't laugh. And we are on episode eight, and uh, we are covering fetishism and totemism in the subject. And this is going to be our last episode as far as shamanism goes. And um, I understand that both terms, fetishism and totemism, are very they're very old world, they're very um, discriminatory, and they're very inappropriate by a lot of people's standards. The problem is that there's really not a better umbrella term that could be used in their place. So I'm using these terms purely as placeholders to define, not even define to kind of um, mark a certain kind of um, behavior, ritual behavior and belief system without attaching to it any sort of a negative connotation that oftentimes has been used with those terms throughout our history, um, especially fetishism, which has taken on its own new life nowadays, but uh, originally it meant something entirely else. And so they're, they're both really outdated terms. They're not politically correct ones. They are the ones that often been used by dominant religions of, of the regions to condemn and put down the people who practiced these sort of beliefs because they were often misunderstood. They were often seen as just as a lot of other archaic belief systems as a form of almost like as devil worship, or um, oftentimes even confused with paganism, which this is, these beliefs may be integrated into paganism, but paganism is not these beliefs, if that makes sense. So, and the reason why, the only other term I can think of for fetishism as a concept is a term from a, a fictional book, one of my favorite ones, but it's a, the term and sold like an object an object has been and sold but it's such a convoluted term and it's so hard to use i'm just going to stick with the well-known concept of a fetish so and it's something that christians in particular have used a lot to condemn other peoples who practice these sorts of sorts of belief to try to portray them in a barbaric very unsophisticated sort of way because thou christians practice the exact same behavior the exact same Outwardly, if you're looking, if you're on the outside looking in the exact same behavioral practices, nonetheless, when they were observing these behaviors in other tribes and peoples, they labeled them as very backwards and as very barbaric, and that's not true. And one of the things um, uh, that oftentimes, for example, one some of the practices, for example, that exist in Catholic Church is your statues of the saints, in uh, Orthodox Church is your icons or portraits of the saints. And of course, oftentimes people will pray to these statues and to these um, icons and they start taking on a life of their own to where you have multiple holy mothers. For example, in Russia, you have holy mother of Kazan, you have a holy mother of Re Rezan, you have various um, miraculous statues. And the common folk, people who, especially in the older times, people who were uneducated oftentimes view these objects, viewed these objects as individual, almost entities of their own. To where a sophisticated, educated Catholic uh, priest, somebody who is well versed in the Catholic doctrine, would say, no, 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 we're not praying to the statue. The statue is merely a representation of a higher entity or higher power. It's, it's, it's basically, it's a vehicle to connect to something beyond this realm. Well, if you ask any anybody in a culture who practices fetishism or totemism, they're going to, well, fetishism in particular, they're going to say the exact same thing. No, I'm not praying to this fetish. Of course not. The fetish is just a way to connect with the spirit. And as I have said before, gods really are spirits. They're just spirits that have grown particularly large. Um, as a little aside, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Terry Pratchett? Small gods all the way. I recommend that book to anyone who wants to understand more about religion, Christianity, Ju Judeo-Christian tradition, and all of the above. Small gods, Terry Pratchett, brilliant book. Skip through the first chapter. It's going to make no sense to you if you haven't read the whole series. And just start at the beginning of when the turtle falls from the sky on top of somebody's head after an eagle has snatched it up and decides, oh my, I am a god. What am I doing here? Anyway, that was just a little aside. Um, I love Terry Pratchett. But... Um, so, again, in fetishism, 
it's a very ancient, very um, inherent to humanity in general, all over the world, really, practice. It's something that occurs not just in um, cultures, it, it occurs in individuals. It's, again, it's another practice that oftentimes happens spontaneously with small children. Unless certain circumstances are met, the spirit that is connected to an object does not exist within the object. The object is really a way to communicate with the spirit. It serves as a window for the spirit into our world or its cell phone. Basically, think of it as a cell phone that you can pick up and call your spirit. But if, for example, if you come across somebody else's fetish and you start performing a lot of different rituals about, around it for a long time, well, that's going to be kind of like a setting off the car alarm underneath the spirit's uh, window. And so when the spirit hears that annoying beep, 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 um, it's probably not going to be very happy with you if it does respond to your annoying and obnoxious, insistent call. But yes, typically, unless some circumstances are met, um, a fetish is really a way of communicating with the spirit. The spirit only pokes his or her head into that fetish object. That fetish object belongs to him or her. It's almost like a world hole between this world and the other one that's very convenient to deal with a spirit and easily summon a spirit. It's a quick communication line. Um, some of the um, kind of side examples, for example, how people, how do people obtain or used to obtain fetishes in certain cultures? And in some of them, they still do. Um, I've, I've heard an account of a Native American culture. I'm not going to tell you which one it was because I don't want to say the wrong one. Uh, but I think I've heard similar stories about some African cultures and def definitely some Siberian ones where, for example, a shaman who wants to obtain a fetish, for example, who wants to create a very useful fetish for easy communication with his or her companion spirit, um, may, for example, mark an animal, a hard-to-kill animal, um, and it, you know, the shaman will go on a quest where it will, for example, let's say it's a buffalo, um, it will mark this buffalo, it will wound this buffalo, not yet, he or she will wound this buffalo and follow the buffalo and kill the buffalo on their own if they're capable of doing that. And kind of while they're following the buffalo, while they're following the blood trail from the first wounds and they're licking that blood and they're smelling that blood, they will name that buffalo and the buffalo will be given the shaman's own secret name. So the buffalo in essence becomes the twin of the shaman. And when the shaman slays this buffalo, he usually needs to consume as much of this buffalo's meat, as much of this buffalo's organs as, it's, as is possible. If possible at all, some of them are cooked, so as much of the essence of the buffalo actually permeates the shaman's body. And once the shaman is completely filled up on this essence of the buffalo, he or she will fall asleep with the remains of the buffalo. And, in, and his and her, I'm just going to call it him, because otherwise it's just going to be he or she nonstop. Uh, so he's going to call on the spirit that his companion spirit and say, hey, companion spirit, I have killed this animal. This animal is me. Come and possess this animal. So we basically it's creating a very convenient object that is you on the one hand that your spirit can easily come into that's convenient for you to carry around and to use in your rituals without having to give up your own body and your own, um, I guess, flesh, your own form for your spirit, especially if it's a spirit, like if it's a spirit that you're very close to and you completely trust, sure, you can let the spirit inside your own body, but that's not typically something that you want to do. It's not a particularly safe practice for a number of reasons. So that's one of the ways that a fetish is obtained. Um, another way that a fetish is obtained is, for example, I know um, their shamans, they will walk along the seashore, you know, the ones who got kind of moved off and pushed out of the Japanese islands and are now in Sahalin they will walk along the seashore and they will use for any, uh, look for any unusual objects that may have washed on shore and they will sing a special shamanistic song and they will be listening for which object might be responding to them, resonating to them. And when they find such an object, they will take that object home with them and they will also sleep with it and kind of conduct a similar um, set of rituals, not identical, but kind of the same essence to where that object is now dedicated to the spirit. And the object really can be anything at all. It's, it, it's anything that the spirit itself, it's a question of what the spirit chooses in that particular case. So, I mean, there is one case of a, an Aino shaman recently who found a kind of like a computer micro kind of motherboard type thing that got really kind of washed up in the ocean. And he really was, he really liked that fetish because it was unique. Nobody else had anything like that. And the spirit thought all those electronic parts were pretty, pretty cool to deal with. Um, another still practice today, I've mentioned it in the previous podcast, Mongolian shamans. Um, they will either smoke a little something, they will smoke a lot of cigarettes, drink 
really strong T. They will race their horse, just anything to get themselves into an altered state of mind. And they will ride when they're in that completely kind of almost out of its state. They will ride out into the open steps and start looking for the first object that catches their eye out of sight. And it may be, I don't know, it may, may be just um, front wing from a tractor or something like that. And they know it's a front wing from a tractor, you know, the front, front, front the wheel cover. But it, again, it's the question of what the spirit chooses. And if that's the object that the spirit chooses, the shaman will pick up that object, bring it back to his location or wherever he is centered at at this particular moment in season and uh, dedicate that object pr uh, properly. David, did you want to say something? Okay. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the ways that the man-made fetishes are sometimes created, but you always have to put a certain, it's a mutual effort between the, if, if it's a voluntary fetish creation between a person and a spirit, the two of them kind of work together in pair to choose the item that would make a really good um, communication device. Any comments or questions? Uh, yeah, I just had uh, something. It, it, I think that it has to do with uh, fetishism or however you want to define it, but I wanted to mention that uh, that I don't think it's always a, a shaman or shaman, however you want to say it. it. One of the things that I find very interesting is that it's very important to many warriors as well because they not only uh, try to name an object, in fact, it's very common practice for a warrior to name their weapon, for example, but people have a tendency to uh, give a certain amount of effort into naming just a lot of everyday objects, and uh, they build basically a relationship with them because they feel, they just feel very connected somehow through this object. Of course, with a warrior, it's very, very special to name your weapon. And even like in Vietnam, I think it was, a lot of people would just name their rifles. <coughs> That's probably been going on for a long time. And actually, as someone that makes, uh, you know, hand weapons, you know, knives, whatever, I have I actually had a tendency to name them. Yeah, it's obviously just not for uh, shamans to have that type of connection. It, it's with no, a lot. Absolutely not, and I agree with you. But it's right now. I'm just talking about like when a shaman specifically needs a ritual object for the shamanistic purposes. So you don't have to be a shaman or shaman. I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep saying shaman. We're almost done with this whole subject, so people are just used it by now. I don't know what the proper pronunciation sure, is. But it's is. a blanket term. It's a blanket term. Yours is proper pronunciation because uh, YouTube uh, subtitles picks up yours and not mine, so I know yours is correct. <laughs> but um, but anyway, so another way that fetishes can occur. Um, again, I'm, we're talking about right now ritualistic uh, fetishes. Of uh, some of the examples, uh, there can be man-made uh, fetishes, which is specifically created by a person for the purpose of being a fetish or sometimes are created by a person without the purpose of being a fetish. Again, my favorite quote, I've said it before, I'll, I will say it again, you know, and it's a, it's a, from a recent book, but uh, helicopters are the souls of dead tanks, right? I mean, oftentimes an object that is exposed to a lot of emotions, that is exposed to a lot of um, various uh, interesting influences, whether it's damage, whether it's uh, intense emotions, whether it's uh, some sort of transformation, for example, when you make a sword out of a, what used to be pretty much look like a piece of rock, right? Spirits are attracted to interesting things. Spirits are attracted to things that are saturated with memories, with emotions. They like those things. They're curious about those things. That they, they <laughs> So out of natural, for example, natural fetishes, the meteorites are well, some of the items that are highly um, likely to attract the spirit. Uh, not only because they fall. Okay, so back in the day, for example, um, a tribesman or a shaman might, might say, okay, this rock fell from the sky rocks don't usually fall from the sky the spirit might be curious about these rocks falling from the sky well today's for example mongolian shaman is going to say Sp the spirit knows that meteorite came out from outer space of course it wants to be part of that meteorite of course it wants to explore it it's curious so as our science changes and our understanding of the world changes so does the science and understanding of the world of the spirits on the other side but they're still curious about unusual things some of the other things could be, for example, um, features like landscape features, like a, a whole of certain, for example, um, fetish of uh, Genghis Khan is the entire mountain, right? The holy mountain of the Mongols. Um, unusual rock formations or rocks, uh, unusual trees, <laughs> trees that have been, for example, struck by lightning and continued growing at an interesting angle or just have very unusual features. Um, anything at all unusual because spirits are super curious. So um, just a little side story about spirits and space travel. So when Mongolians, uh, first Mongolian cosmonaut finally went out into outer space, 
a couple of shamans came to him and he, uh, you know they said look because they allowed x amount of personal artifacts and personal items on board they came to him. I, I, I apologize i don't remember this uh, guy's name and i should probably look it up and put it under the podcast because it's worth remembering but a number of shamans came to him and said our spirits really want to go to outer space i mean come on you're going to outer space our spirits came to us and said hey there's a rocket going to outer space. We want to check it out. Send us, send us, send us. And so when he flew on that flight, he took with him a number of fetishes of spirits of various, very powerful shamans in Mongolia. So now Mongolian spirits have traveled to outer space. Awesome. Um, another story, and I don't know how true it is. I've heard it as a third-hand account through a fourth-hand person. It sounds fairly compelling, but the idea is that the American shuttle, space shuttles, all of them had uh, powerful spirits actually trapped and attached to them. Not a willing situation, but actually were partially spirit driven. I don't know how true that is. Has anybody else heard anything about that? I've heard it from a fairly reputable source, but either, even if it's not true, it's a cool idea to think about just as a kind of side fairy tale. Um, I, I would love to look it up. I tried to look it up. There's not, Google gave me absolutely nothing and I did not obviously hear it from an English language source. So again, I said fetishes, I've already talked about the fact that fetishes are like, they're basically your landline or your cell phone number, your personal private cell phone number that you have to your spirit or a spirit or the spirit, whichever one, like even a God. For example, to this day, altars have to be dedicated. Why do altars have to be dedicated? Because in a way, the altar is that God's fetish. I mean, any sacrificial altar, anything that is used like that ceremony, even in Catholic and Orthodox churches, you have to, up until very recently, definitely in Catholic, you have to dedicate the altar so that that altar becomes attached to the God. So when you're doing something on that altar, the God is going to be aware that you're calling out to it. Or in case of spirits, of course, if you're doing a sacrifice to a specific spirit, you want the spirit to know that this is something. This, If this number rings, it's kind of like putting your number into their phone book, right? If that if call is coming in from this number, it's probably important. Um, now, um, Living fetishes is another big subject, and it's kind of a scary subject. There are certain um, people who practice that, uh, to, for whom their skin is actually their fetish. And this, and I actually, I have a novel, and in that novel, that concept is highly ex, uh, kind of exploited, where when you put a tattoo, and in a lot of movies, and a lot of mass media, when you put a tattoo on your skin, right, and at certain moments through certain rituals, those tattoos suddenly come alive and become separate entities from you. Well, that's a fetish that you always carry on yourself. On the one hand, it's super convenient. On the other hand, it's kind of dangerous because that you can't remove it from your skin. This is this is a, a phone that it rings. You always have to pick it up. It's like that big red phone that used to stand in the president's office back during Cold War, right? Um, okay, can you make, for example, your cat into a fetish? Absolutely, you can. Except in the process, you're probably going to kill your cat. So if you like your cat, do not make your cat into a fetish. That's not nice to the kitty. We all like kitties. Um, a spirit can be born into uh, a human body, like the great Han Gesser. Gesser. I'm just going to say it the way it's said in Russian, Mongolia, Gesser. Um, he was a spirit who was actually born into a human being. But in that case, you don't have um, a fetish per se. You have an incarnation or an avatar is another thing that is very similar. Um, those concepts are a little bit confused. Now, Christ, according to Christian doctrine, was not an avatar. He is not. He was not. Re uh, he is not an incarnation. He is um, a God in a human body, so a spirit in a human body, but not a fetish. It's kind of weird. I'm not sure. My friend who is very Catholic, who tried to understand this concept and inquired about it quite a bit, unfortunately, never got a straight answer from the Catholic Church regarding bottom line is they're just saying, nope, Christ is definitely not an avatar. He's not an incarnation. Um, he's just a God who was born in a human body for some reason. Um, so then you can make a human fetish and that's something All right. i was just going to say it's interesting i um although i'm a christian theologian we visited a hindu temple that was in our parish once for a lenten study series and uh, they have the idea they have the same idea as christians of one god but they believe that god has come to earth it's very you just froze up colin Okay, I'm just going to continue until you come back, but you froze up. Can everybody else hear me? Wiggle your hands if you can. Okay. So, yeah. any, okay, Colin, sorry, you froze up real bad. Okay. So, anyway, um, but I heard what you're saying. So, what you're talking about, the vision of Krishna, a thing uh, which oftentimes uh, some of the gods in, in the Hindu religion, they can re 
reincarnate and they sometimes can have more than one avatar so they can have a woman and a man and something else at the same time living on this planet and those in that as it's kind of a interesting theological question and i don't think it has a definitive answer because honestly in questions of belief and faith nobody really cares about classification but is that really an avatar or is that really a fetish but regardless these are the cases of actual spirits in some cases great spirits manifesting themselves through a human vehicle and it's not quite the same as a fetish a fetish is when you take a person who's either completely mentally disabled basically a vegetable or you take a healthy person and you lobotomize them or otherwise make them a vegetable and then you use the shell of that person to put inside of them a spirit. This is a very cruel and very looked down upon practice. There are some powerful shamans who do practice that. They're usually very feared. These are the scary magicians. These are your dark witches. These are the people that are st st uh, stuff of legends. Tanjin, whom I've mentioned before, the great uh, dark Mongolian shaman of legend, he had five of those. So he had five enemies enemy shamans at that one point in time got sick of his ways and they got together and they basically formed something like a shamanistic magic circle to try to in combination get rid of him and when they did that he fought them and of course his lover spirit uh, of carolyn of the river who did who was not interested in his partner being exed out of this existence he came to his aid and together they defeated the five shamans and they basically turned them into vegetables by various torturous means. And they, from that point on, they became his personal living fetishes, but he was a cruel, scary individual. This is not something you want to do to your enemies, even if you really do not like them. Um, another example of that situation is uh, your uh, Greek oracle, Delphi, or Pythia, as she was known. In very early Greek practices, there's a good, good, good understanding that potentially, originally, rather than breathing the vapors from the that volcanic crack uh, that she was actually either made to be a mentally capable person or they found somebody who was born that way as a prophecy now later on of course in civilized greece that practice stopped entirely and you had a perfectly healthy normal woman who would just get intoxicated and pronounce her uh kind of oracle you know her what's the word for it fortune tell not fortune tell. <laughs> just i'm having a brain freeze for a minute Prediction. Prophecy. Prophecies. Prediction. Thank you. That's the word. It just was on the tip of my tongue. Um, so the thing, there's a l weird correlation between big, small creature, spirit, and a big, small object. A really large, like we, we're talking about in the uh, Hindu religion, a very large, very powerful spirit can possess very small objects. It's not a problem. It can, it can have multiple fetishes around, but a very small, tiny, cute, little, I don't know, flower spirit, it's probably not going to be able to possess a mountain. Uh, it's probably not going to be very comfortable so you when creating a fetish for you know your first fetish for your first little pet spirit you probably don't want to you know make it an entire i don't know mountain range might not fit very well um the kind of object it is like the price of the object typically does not matter for some spirits it does for others it doesn't at all uh so pretty much anything that a spirit happens to like can be used as a fetish and these things can be quite strange to people observing them. So for example, there's a case of one Siberian shaman who had a Coca-Cola, like a really cool looking special edition McDonald's Coca-Cola glass. You know, and he, when, when ethnographers came to talk to this man, he had his collection of fetishes and he was saying, oh, this is the toe bone from the first bear I killed. And this is, I don't know, my favorite dog's dried ear. And this is, uh, I don't know, the tooth from my firstborn child. And and this is going a glass from nearby McDonald's because, well, one of the spirits just thought it was a super cool glass and it wanted it as its fetish. So the value of objects in human sense does not make any difference to the spirits. They have their own ideas and canons. Go ahead, Ryan. I was just going to say that uh, kind of reminded me of all the old um, stories about, you know, you have the, uh, the genie, you know, the wish granting demon and the lamp. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get to that. Genie is going to be my next subject. Yep. So what happens if you, okay, so you have a fetish. You went through all this trouble. You made a fetish, right? Let's say it's a vase. And you keep this vase on your fireplace, you know, mantle, whatever. And one day you come home and, you, and the vase is just in shutters. Well, what does that mean? That does not usually mean anything good. It's one of the two things. Either it's kind of like, that's it. We break up. Never write me again and take all your presents back sort of thing. And the spirit is just done with you. Or the spirit could be in extreme trouble on the other side. It might be in grave danger, and this might be an SOS sign. So at that point in time, you need to quickly get to the other side and figure out what the hell is going on, what you have done to upset your spirit, or what has happened to your spirit friend 
or your spirit companion. Uh, now, what you were talking about, Ryan, is the forcible and complete entrapment uh, of a uh, spirit in an object. And this is something that is typically a very cruel, it's, it's kind of like solitary confinement, it's messed up. Now, if you confine a spirit to a living creature, for example, well, a spirit can deal with it, right? Because a living creature kind of runs around and does stuff, there's stuff to do, stuff to see. But let's say you're a very powerful shaman or a very powerful priest in later religions, and you take a spirit and you subdue the spirit and you put it inside a five cent coin, right? And then you go into the ocean and lay there at the bottom of the ocean for the next 5,000 years. And that's where we come to this lovely story of the King Shloma, also known as Great Wise Solomon, who contracted some demons to do some work for him on a certain temple. And half of the demons, I'm gonna leave that part out of the story, but the other half of the demons, the male contractors, he did not feel like paying them. And that's what he did to his workers. Basically, he hired some out of town, you know, alien migrant basically workers. And, um, and instead of paying them as per agreed, he entrapped their souls, entrapped their spirits, completely entrapped them inside these uh, vases, and then they tossed them into the ocean. And that's where that story comes from in the Arabic world. And that's where you get the idea of the genie that I have laid at the bottom of the ocean for 1,000 years, and I have promised that the first person who frees me, I'm going to give him a kingdom. And for another 1,000 years, I laid at the bottom of the ocean, and I thought to myself, I will give him a kingdom and the most beautiful woman in the world. And I laid there for another 3,000 years, and I decided that I shall murder the first person who frees me. Because after 3,000 years of complete nothingness and sensory isolation and basically solitary confinement, even the most benevolent, even the most kindly and good, strong spirit is probably going to go a little cuckoo. Shloma is not like the Mon spirits, I'll put it this way, also known as King Solomon. Not my favorite character. Um, okay, um, Dustin, are you there? Because I need your help with this next one, because I know I'm going to mess up the pronunciation. So I'm going to do the Mongolia first, then come back, because I'm doing Ireland next. Okay, so Mongolia, to this day, uh, train operators, um, when you get a train and you, what is the part of the train called that pulls the train people? Yeah, locomotive. locomotive, yeah. The, the front, the, the part where the engine is, what's the name for that? Some, some people just call it the engine, um, and uh, the operator that operates the engine is typically called the engineer of all things. At least right, the but bottom line is, I'm just going to call it the train, but when I say the train, what I'm referring to is this part of the train that's obviously doing all the labor. In Mongolia to this day, anytime you get a powerful piece of machinery, let's say train, you need to find a spirit that will willingly move into that particular item of machinery so that the train can run well and kind of be it's spirit powered trains, right? But if you mess up and you put a, too powerful of a spirit into your train, that's when you get cases with your trains just running off tracks and doing other weird things. So, um, okay, Dustin, I'm gonna need your help with this on mute because I'm gonna be mispronouncing this horribly. So Ireland. Same column, Kelly. Am I pronouncing this correct? Dustin? If they can't hear me. Can you say that again? Same column, I Kelly? Uh, no, but we'll go with it. Okay, well, help me out. How do you say it? Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't know how to say that one either. Okay, I only have the Russian version, so I'm just doing. If it's Russianized, it's Russianized, but it's close enough at least in Russian. Um, but anyway, he was a very. He's he's obviously a Christian saint, and he made pretty good friends with. Uh, I'm going to pronounce this one wrong. Dian Dian uh, who was a fairy. Dian Say that again. Dian Ket. Dian Ket. So he, who was a, basically a fairy, for lack of a better term, and uh, kind of almost a Christian, like this close. And so with the help of his friend, um, Colin Kelly, was able to trap a very evil, wicked creature, spirit, and trap it in his staff. And the staff is what kept this evil spirit contained, you know, kept it from harming Ireland for centuries and centuries. And then you... Oliver Cromwell. And um, burned the monasteries and broke the staff. And then hell got unleashed and everything went really badly. And uh, Ireland starved and Britain burned and nobody involved in that whole case has ended very well. And we still have problems in Ireland today because somebody unleashed that spirit from that fetish. So people be very careful breaking strange fetishes. You never know what you might let out. Um, now, speaking of being let out, 
a spirit, for example, can come to you, for example, in your dreams over and over, a spirit can come to you and you will hear it asking, hey, I'm trapped, help me out. And you hear that in mass media a lot. You hear that in fairy tales, the idea of somebody having the dreams or hearing voices of something asking for help. And then they're going and freeing it. I think we had a similar story. I don't remember now which one of the Siberian tribes where the daughter went and freed the space, three spirits that her father had entrapped. Well, that's sometimes it might turn out wonderful for you and the spirit may be forever grateful to you. 90% of the time, uh, there's probably a reason why that spirit is trapped in that object. Either way, you probably want to be very careful when you answer that sort of call. I'm going to stop for a second before we move on to other stuff. Um, I actually wanted to go back, uh, regress a little bit, if that's uh -huh. all right. Of back to um, uh, uh, fetishes, uh, fetishes about uh, objects. This is in a little bit different context, but I'm just curious if anybody has any thoughts about this. Um, an object that was basically revered and uh, basically it was a fetish because it stood out and many, many people put a lot of, uh, you know, energy into it, but then it is just suddenly destroyed. Basically, uh, there was an object, um, we used to call it the rock, and uh, somebody basically uh, just plowed over it, but this was obviously like a sacred site for I don't know how long. The trails were worn very deep, and it, it didn't start in like the 1930s or the 40s. It probably was starting before that. And a lot of people obviously revered this strange object, and they've been going to it for I don't know how long. But it doesn't seem like it would probably be a good idea to just destroy a fetish object like that. It doesn't seem like it would probably be a good idea. No, I wish that I could go back to what's left of it. Yeah, and another example of that is icons, and like, uh, I don't know Catholic religion as well, but I know the Russian Orthodox religion, for example, you know, when you have an icon, an icon is basically a painting of a symbol, some, somewhat symbolic representation of a specific saint or of, of the Holy Mother. We don't really use the term Madonna in Russian culture, we use the term Holy Mother because she's always viewed almost as a mother goddess, and not so much as the Virgin, um, or a likeness of Christ, but it's basically, it's a wooden board, right, with just some paint on it. But when you take that icon and people start praying to it and they pray to it over and over and over, over time that icon gains power and it becomes very magical, very intense. Uh, David is jumping in, I'm gonna silence myself. Um, just want to bring up like Eastern ancestor shrines. Uh, seems like they would have a similar, they're prayed to and, and in that situation where they were destroyed. I mean, like Chinese, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I think I would think it's similar. Yeah, actually, you know, it is the same thing. You're right. Yeah. And actually we're going to get to that here in a second. Yeah. Go ahead. Actually, thank you for bringing that up because I'm, I almost forgot to touch on this. Um, let me get through my, actually, no, I don't, I don't need to get through anything else. So, um, so what you were saying, ancestors, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to, don't let me forget the shaman staff, okay, because I, that's something I want to go over. So the, the human remains fetishes, first of all, uh, in certain traditions uh, in voodoo, from what I understand and from what I have heard, um, particularly the remains of your beloved relatives. It's a tradition that's very, very old in human society. And even pre-human society, there's some indication that Neanderthals and other hominid species practice something similar. It seems to be very intuitive when you lose a relative to take a part of that relative, especially the head, and to use it as almost a natural fetish. Um, to communicate with that ancestor. And it doesn't mean that your ancestor now lives inside of that item or that body part, but it means, or for example, in Japanese culture, sometimes it's their favorite teapot or something like what you, I'm not as familiar with Chinese, um, but I have, in Thailand, I know that, in Thailand, and that's, I know a little bit about it, where they have um, certain parts, they have this sort of shamanistic tradition. What they do is they, they have special shops where you can go and buy special dolls. Um, so, for example, your grandma has passed away. Well, grandma wants to live in her house. She wants to watch TV. She wants to do all the things she usually did. Well, you love your grandma. You want your grandma to be happy. But if grandma's going to be walking back and forth all night long, keeping you up and grumbling at you for changing her TV channel, you're not going to be happy. Grandma's not going to be happy, right? So you're going to go 
to the special store. You're going to buy, well, first of all, you're going to build a nice little house for grandma outside of your house. Then you're going to go buy a nice little doll from a special store that looks just like grandma or looks like the way grandma would have liked to look. And you put grandma inside of her little house. And that's now your grandma's fetish. Your grandma's actual spirit now lives in that house. Well, she's going to be bored there. So then you go buy a couple of servant dolls and you and so on and so forth. Maybe your grandma wants to travel. Well, you can go buy a special travel animal for the grandma. And it's a whole collection that grows around it. And then you offer things. For example, if it's your grandpa, maybe he likes to have a drink every night. So every night you make sure and you bring a drink to that shrine, basically. So it's a very similar concept. I think that's kind of what you're talking about. I don't know enough yes. about I know my knowledge of China. My knowledge of China ends where you know Imperial China begins pretty much completely. That's about where my knowledge of China pretty much cuts off, and that's one region that I'm not very knowledgeable on, unfortunately. Um, so, and then voodoo is specifically being attacked. I mean, the, the idea of, for example, if your father was a great musician, he was a great violinist, right? You might want to preserve his magical fingers along with his magical violin because it is a way to communicate with your father. It's a, it's a sign of respect. It's a, it's a way of keeping something. There was a real kind of a, almost cult of the sort of neo-fetishism in the 19th century was the whole idea of having a lock of your loved one's hair and a little medallion around your neck. It's kind of a similar concept. People even use it to communicate with other living individuals. For example, soldiers at war will oftentimes take like a lock of their beloved, of their wife's hair or something like that, because it's the same thing. It's a connection, it's a communication device. And then uh, a phenomenon that is not very widespread in Native American culture, from what I understand, it is extremely widespread on, on, on the Eurasian side of Siberia, among every culture, regardless of the culture's origin. So it's something that must have um, originated in one culture and that kind of spread as a mem from one culture to another. But it's the idea of shamanistic or shaman staff. So what is a shaman staff? It is a fetish. It's your personal fetish. But it's, you know how in... Um, Gosh, Harry Potter, when they do, when if you grab somebody else's magical stick or whatever it's called, basically you get their power. Well, this stuff does not work that way. If you get your enemy's staff, of you do something to the staff, you may rid them of their ability to use it, but to you, it's completely useless. It's a useless item to anyone but the shaman himself or herself. Why? Well, because the way the staff is made is when you're still a little baby shaman and you're doing your very first ritual. And let's say you found a lost deer somewhere in the, you know, in the wilderness. And when you've finally succeeded and you found that lost deer, you ask them to take off a little bell of the deer's um, you know, reins and you put that on your little stick of a staff. And then you fall in love and you really like this girl, but she doesn't like you back. And let's say you bought a flower for her, you bought a little vase for her. Well, she turns you down and you break this vase, right? Well, you take a chunk of that vase and you attach it to your staff. And then let's say you fall in love again and it's, it's magical, it's mutual and you have this amazing sex and you're just happy and in love. And she gives you a necklace when you attach that necklace. And every little event that happens in your life, whether good or bad, little map, if you choose to, you don't have to do it for every event, but everything that's significant to you, you attach that little, it's a lot of, it's a lot like, what are they called? Um, uh, housewives do them around here. Scrapbooks. It's kind of like a scrapbook, but it's a shaman scrapbook and it has items. So you, let's say you kill an enemy, you cut off his nose and you dry the nose and you attach it to your stuff. But by the time you get to be really massive old shaman, your staff could be, you know, three meters, you know, five feet tall and weighing about a ton. But the power in that object, it's your power. Nobody else will ever be able to use it. Go ahead, Colin. Are you muted? Colin, you muted. There we go. Um, it, I think in the, for the natives um, in the West Coast, at least from the Klingit, the Haida, the Salish and so on, they use masks, not a staff. And have a very similar idea, but not all natives do this. But it's certainly in the West Coast they do. Yep, and I I know that totem poles basically, which we guys we're gonna go over a little bit over today, probably about fifteen minutes. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, because okay I with me. I was gonna mention something also that's related, but oh, finish first. So anyway, so shaman stuff is, and I, I think totem poles are used in the same way, except the totem pole, from what I understand at least, it's a kind of a tribal basically staff it's basically it's a fetish it's it has nothing to do with totems per se necessarily it's not it's not a tot, totemism is a concept and what's called a totem pole and not really related directly related objects i mean there might be some crossover but typically it's basically a convenient place to hang or to attach a bunch of fetishes that are tribe-wide is my understanding mm. 
They have carvings. And well, yeah, carvings and stuff, but it's basically, it's, it's a collection of fetishes. It has nothing to do directly with your totem, with tribal totem as such. Uh, what did you want to say, Ryan? Um, this isn't um, entirely related to what you were talking about. Um, and actually, I think that uh, Colin uh, might know more about it, but um, I was thinking for some reason that the, uh, the totem reminded me of uh, something that I was reading about recently. This is something that's a little bit of a new concept, but it's called the, uh, the talking stick, which is kind of a fetish also. And it's the uh, stick that, well, when you have this, it's basically like a totem, but it's called a talking stick, I guess, to some people. And Brian, just really quick question. When you say totem, what do you mean? Because totem is not an object. Um, well, it's representative of a totem. It's usually... It's a um, fetish is what you're saying, right? Yeah, well, the talking stick, from my understanding, is basically a fetish object. And uh, the reason that it is significant is that when you're having a council and a discussion, you know, it's kind of like raising your hand almost when you're in, in school, you know. Okay, you have the floor. Whoever has the talking stick, as long as they have it, ah. they can speak. But then, once it's passed on, you shut up. And on that note, I shut up now. <laughs> yeah, I've used that before in fights, in relationships. But um, no, but um, no, the reason, I'm sorry I interrupted you there. Just I wanted to clarify because if anybody else is listening to us, because a totem is a completely different concept. So what you're talking about is a fetish object. Uh, totem is not an object. A totem is a reality. I don't know how else to explain it. And that's, oh, go ahead, no, Colin. I, I agree. A, a totem, totem pole is basically, um, it's a, a family lineages and clan um, animals and things like that. So totem pole basically says, this is the guy that lives here and this is his family. So it does, it does a, not, it's not a fetish or a totem or anything. It's basically a sign. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying that. See, I knew somebody would know. Good. Yeah, because, but regardless, it, it's not, uh, so it makes sense. It's kind of like the Tenga signs over the caves uh, in, you know, ancient Siberia, basically. It's like gang graffiti, graffiti, the same thing. This is my hood, this is who I am, this is who I am. Um, okay, so now I want to jump to totems, and this is going to be very difficult. This is probably the most abused um, word of them all and misused word throughout history, uh, especially modern um, Christian history. So what is a totem? And this is going to be kind of a convoluted and complicated explanation. A totem is a, it's an actual spiritual, mental, and partially physical genetic connection with a specific type of an animal, specific breed of an animal, specific, specific particular species of an animal. Not all foxes, just this kind of a fox. Not all bears, just the cave bear. Um, it, creature that is an actual living biological animal creature that lives in the surrounding area where you and your tribe live, that is the same people as you. In other words, if you, you are told him as a wolf, and it's usually not an individual phenomenon. On a rare basis, it can be an individual phenomenon, but usually it's, a, it's either tribal or a clan, lineage, bloodline phenomenon. Um, if you're wolves, that means you and the wolves are the same people. And the village that's next to you that happens to be pines, and by the way, this does not have to be an animal. It can be um, also a plant. If the people living next to you are pines, you have more in common with the wolves running around in the, in the forest than you do with the people living in the next village over because they are pines and you're wolves. Am I making sense? No, that, that makes a lot of sense uh, from, from my understanding of the term at least. It's, uh, but I'm not an expert on totems or anything, but my understanding of a totem is that it's very important that, uh, like when you make a totem pole, you usually use animals, but these are animals that you have a lot in common with in terms of they are part of your society, your culture, that's why you pick them. That's just mm -hmm. my opinion. No, Sorry, it, Colin, it, let me respond to that. You don't pick your totem. You are born well, your totem. Yes. It is your genetical lineage. You, if you occasionally, very occasionally, and we'll go over this, there can be a case where in a wolf clan, for example, a ram can be born, and that's a whole tragedy. That's That's some sort of a genetic, it's, 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 a, it's some sort of a freak accident of genetics. You don't choose your totem. You, a totem is not a spirit animal. A totem, you are all the wolves in your neighborhood. And all the wolves in the neighborhood are all of the people in your clan. 
you're one people with them. You literally have the same blood. Colin, you were going to say? I thought about it that yeah, way. Yeah, my, my experience is that they, these, these animals and things belong to clans. And they're, um, they're youth, like up around where I am right now, there's usually two clans. There's the, the ravens and the wolves. And uh, they all live together. But they, like the Haida have some very complicated intermarriage relationships between the, the, the different clans. Like you're, you're supposed to marry outside your clan and the clans go through the, the woman. That's a matriarchal society. A lot of new societies are matriarchal. So the clan, the clan has an animal. Right. So, okay. So how are you connect? Okay. So it's a clan wide phenomenon. Like I said, occasionally in some tribes, there may be a situation when you have a couple of blood, blood lineages, like if it's a really large tribe and there might, might be, you know, deers, deer and I don't know, minks living next to each other. I'm just making animals up out of the top of my head. But sometimes you may have a situation where a tribe is comprised of several totemic lineages, but each lineage is you're born into it. And you have a mystic, I don't want to say mystical. You have a spiritual, uh, emotional, blood, genetic connection with any and every fox of that particular species in, in the neighborhood. And any fox of that spe specific species in, in the neighborhood has a genetic connection with you, which means that you and them are one on the other side. On the, so, for example, you in the, in the village of the pine people next door to you, you look the same in this world, right? Well, on the other side, they look like pines and you look like foxes. Um, and you would have harder time communicating with your neighboring village than you would with a fox in the woods. Moreover, um, if you were to kill, a, to kill one of those people in the village next to you is a lot less of a problem than to accidentally kill a fox. So and, and, let's say a fox breaks, let's say you are settled people and let's say you keep chickens. Let's just make this up, right? And a fox breaks in your coop and kills all your chickens. If you kill that fox, you are pretty much screwed. Because you just killed a blood brother. You literally killed a relative. You murdered a relative. To where if one of the neighbors broke into the, from the neighboring village, broke into your chicken coop and stole your chickens and you killed that person. You would have just been killing a stranger, a thief. Because fog, the fox is one of us. They are not. They're pines. Um, that creates sometimes in some situations, it creates some complications with intermarriages. Um, my understanding is in some cultures, it's preferred that you stay as close to your totem animals compatibilities at least keep mammals with mammals and trees with trees if possible i mean if it's not possible i mean marrying a pine to um i don't know a porcupine sorry for the bad joke there but probably not a very good idea because they're going to have a really hard time getting along it's not prohibited it's, it's not directly prohibited by any sort of law, laws or rules or custom but it's, it's generally considered to be a bad match um so th again this is a really really old um phenomenon and I think it stems to and a lot of people think it stems to a time when the line between humans and animals was not so you know cut and dry as it is today especially with Christianity where people are special and different from animals and animals are just something else for humans to use people who lived with nature who still live with nature they see these animals they understand these animals are not that different from themselves um, and they the line is blurred so if you and the wolves are the same bloodline you're not going to go out there and slaughter wolves carelessly because you're literally killing human beings, if that makes sense. But there's the concept of human being doesn't even exist in your culture because you just, you just that, that thing. And the way that you're connected to, that's one thing I didn't get to, the way that you're connected to your totem brothers, I guess, for lack of, to your totem reality is one of the ways, for example, could be through dreams. So whenever you fall asleep, if, if you're an average member of the tribe, if you're not some special, you know, shaman with powers, when you fall asleep, you and one of these animals, one of your totem creatures will be switching um, souls. Or in some cases, more commonly switching dreams. So you're dreaming his dream and he is dreaming your dream. And if one day a person, so that's where the kind of, in some tribes, the idea of waking a person up suddenly is not such a good, one of the reasons, not, not the only one, waking a person up suddenly is not such a good idea because you might wake them up and there's a wolf inside that body. When you wake somebody up and they go, ah, leave me alone, let me go back to sleep. I mean, there's a good chance you just woke up a wolf and somewhere in the forest, there's now a wolf, you know, running around going, what's going on, what's going on? Where, where? Um, so if you let the person go back to sleep, oftentimes they will be able to 
kind of switch back. And every time you don't switch with a specific wolf, you can have a specific relationship with a specific wolf that you might find in the woods and tame and you and that wolf now have a normal this world relationship. But your rotation, it's all the wolves and all the people in the tribe. So you share each other's experiences in a way you sense each other. You almost have a psychic connection. You understand. So if you pine, you can understand the way pines think. And pines can understand the way you think. They and you are one. Um, and I think it's a tradition that probably goes as far back as Neanderthals. You know, we talked about that bear um, cult idea with Neanderthals. Um, it seems to me very likely that that was a combination of actually probably totemism of some sorts and probably, you know, fetishism of some sorts where those skulls were brought there for a reason and they were representing of something, representative of something. We have no proof of it. There is no way to scientifically prove it until we find, you know, Neanderthal from the past and, you know, question him with the CIA. But um, it's a, to me, it seems a reasonable extrapolation that possibly that's that kind of behavior is something very similar to it. Um, what, what else was I going to say? And if you don't let the person switch back, they can get lost completely and wind up being in a wolf forever. And that's some of the kind of a werewolf type ideas in some of the tribal societies, not all of them, but some of them kind of stem from that concept to where somebody with more control of shaman, for example, can do it more targetedly with a specific animal and with a specific purpose. And actually, the thing is, an average tribe member is not going to be able to control the animal while they're in the animal, if that's their belief. Uh, to where shaman might be able to be inside, kind of like in the ga Game of Thrones, right? The whole idea of being inside the cat and seeing through the cat's eyes, or being inside a wolf and making wolf act a certain working, basically, you know. Um, and similar, um, so the best known totemic co uh, culture is the Ainu culture, which is unfortunately not doing so well, but they had, and they still have a, until it got outlawed very recently, um, a tradition where they would find a baby bear somewhere in the forest they would bring the baby bear back to the village and the baby bear would become a member of that village the baby bear would be given a human name the baby bear would be cared for fed very well treated as a member of the society pampered the baby bear once it started growing up got first you know death or two and then married to either a man or woman depending on the bear's sex and it would have a wife or husband and this bear would live with the villagers until the bear started getting old and when the bear was starting to get to a certain age, the whole village would come together for a special ritual. And they would very painlessly, with much ritual, with much prayer, you know, prayers, but in, not even prayers, but song and the pr proper actions, they would slaughter this bear, kill this bear, but very gently. And then they would consume this bear. Well, this bear, it's a member of the tribe. It's not really a bear because it's their totem animal. It's, they just kill one of their own. This bear was being sent off as a messenger was messages to the other side from all the tribes people. And this is a recorded, ethnographically recorded uh, tradition. Um, Japanese uh, have uh, some records of when they first encountered Aino um, that, well, even towards the end of their ongoing war and slaughter was, was the Aino people, that Aino actually used to sacrifice a human being and not a bear in that capacity. And this actually reminds me of something that um, I'm aware of, very highly aware of. and. You know, back in the days when Britain was the Emerald Island and uh, not Ireland, and uh, I'm not even sure which peoples it were. I, me and Dustin tried to figure it out earlier, but I think it was early Celts, possibly even pre-Celt population. But they had a totemic relationship with the wolves, and they had this concept that uh, people, men, particularly young men, could switch back and forth into wolves at will. But they had a very similar ritual when they needed to send a message to the spirits, they would slaughter usually the best young hunter. And not as much slaughter, they would just throw him in the river. Um, I remember that fairly well. Um, but that, you know, the Aino ritual to me just really reminds me of that. And because the Aino culture is as far as you can possibly get culturally, linguistically, ethnographically from the early Celts or even Proto-Europeans, uh, it's probably something that's very old, or very old in human cultures and traditions. Um, some of the echoes of the remaining, the last, I'm almost done with this bit, the very last um, echoes um, that are left of the um, totemic existences, at least in Europe, is of course the Slavic bear relationship. You know, mother, you know, Russian bear, the, the whole idea of bear in Russia, it's not there just as a saying, it's because bear in Russian tradition and Russian fairy tales in a lot of Slavic actually folklore is literally the totemic animal. It's, it's, it's an animal that is, human and not human, it is an animal that 
is so correlated with people as to become synonymous with them. Very similar uh, relationship, for example, um, happened in the Caucasian people and the, particularly the area of Dagestan with the wolves, where wolves and uh, people of a certain Dag Dagestani population, there's multiple tribes there. And that's even reflected in the very well-known recorded, uh, the epic of Nart. It's a Caucasian. It's one of the oldest surviving Indo-European and not in the Indo-European just because it's, it belongs to the Alans. Um, well, now that, nowadays it, uh, it belongs to, um, gosh, it's threw out of my name. I'll remember. Oh, so. oh, Ossetian. Ossetian is what the people call today, but they actually call, they, they call their country Alania. They're the last of surviving, you know, yeah. proto, like the true European Aryans, the true, true Aryans that came from the Scythians, that came from the Sarmatians. But it's their epics intermixed with the local tribes, which the Caucasian population is very tonic it's very archaic it's so archaic the languages and the traditions because they've been so isolated and they still are it goes back to really very prehistoric times and it's very unique source and because there's some layers in that epic that is very well studied even by western scientists that are very 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 archaic they go to the time of the you know pretty much paleolithic venus as a concept kind of that mother concept mother uh, death and mo mother and death female figure um they talk about this kind of um, uh, totemic relationship with the wolf. And there's echoes of that also, uh, you know, in the Roman tradition with the wolves and a lot of other uh, cultures. I can't think of any right off the top of my head, but I'm sure all of you can because it's just, it echoes throughout civilization. And actually the very last, um, oh, scapegoat, I asked you to make notes for me. So yeah, so scapegoat, the, the, something that Marvine said, Marvine is 100% Jewish. He is a Karn, uh, so he's allowed to make Jewish jokes, and I'm partially Jewish, so I guess I'm kind of too. But um, he made kind of a joke about it's interesting to think whether or not the scapegoat was maybe potentially a totemic relationship with the certain people of certain region. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's more of a funny. But where you do where you do see the last echoes in Europe in, in Western Europe is in the heraldry of the knights. And those first heraldic animals that originally really were the signs of the totem animals on the uh, on the posts on the whatever representations that those peoples carried on their weapons that later transformed into this very complicated feudal heraldic system. But a lot of these lions, a lot of these uh, creatures, they are really totemic animals. Um, does anybody have any questions? I have like two small side issues, and I'm done after that. And I think David had something else to say. Um, I didn't have so much a question, but uh, I was going to say that I guess I wasn't really familiar with the term uh, totem, but I I do find it interesting to ponder. So basically, uh, what you're telling me is that the totem is most, sorry, what? Otherkin is a neo-totemic kind of pseudo-totemic modern phenomenon. It's basically the an the animals that you are born with and you're stuck with. That's part of what it goes to there. Yep. Right. Well, you that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Anyone else want to say anything? Okay, then I'm just going to say a couple more things. Um, Just real quick, the issue of, of, of uh, trans totemism. Yes, once in a blue moon, you get a situation when a person is born something other than their own totem. And that's usually very tragic because, for example, you're from the clan of coyotes and you're born and you are a gray swan. You try to be a coyote, you spend your whole life trying to be a coyote. And one of the two things happen. I mean, either you don't know what you are and you just tortured your whole life. I mean, it's very similar to being a transsexual in a way. Um, or you one day maybe see you. And the, the key thing is you have to see a totem animal. You cannot just be a totem animal that you have never physically interacted with or at least interacted with in a dream. A dreams in reality and those kind of traditions, they're one and the same more or less. Um, so you have to at least dream that you are that animal, not just dream of that animal. You have to be that animal in your dream. Literally look down and see paws instead of hands. Uh, but you might dream, for example, one day that you're a gray swan. And then you might come to your mom and dad and say, mom and dad, look, I, I have some bad news for you. I'm sorry. Now I've tried to be a coyote. I, I've tried to, you know, fulfill you, you know, your expectations and be like all the people in our tribe. But I, I'm sorry, I'm just different than everyone else. And chances after that, your children, if you have any, are going to be gray swans from that point on because your totem is different. Um, a totem sometimes will come to an individual within a tribe and choose an individual or I don't know if it was something that it's like I said, it's a lot like transsexuality. It's something that just happens. There's a story of a Native American man who was um, 
having similar issues. And he was visiting a zoo somewhere, I think in New York City. And he saw at the zoo, uh, the Asian um, pronghorn um, ram. And he realized that this was it. This was his totem. And this man, I mean, he is a Native American here in the United States. And this particular ram does not live anywhere but the zoo on this continent. This animal lives in the mountains of Caucasus somewhere between Asia and Russia. So this man has been, you know, connect, collecting money for charity for these animals and been trying to travel there and potentially move there because you want to live close to where the range of your totem, totem animal is. And the last subject, what is if your totem animal is something weird? For example, what is if your totem animal is a dinosaur? What if it's a dragon? Well, then you have a problem. Or what if it's a squid? Then you have a real problem. For example, with the dinosaur, right? Dinosaurs are extinct. Well, you can't have an extinct animal as your totem animal if you're, because if they're extinct, you're extinct, you are them, which probably means the dinosaurs still exist somewhere. They just don't exist on this side of reality anymore. They have all moved into the other side of reality and you're having serious problems and you're likely to go crazy because for a normal person who is not trained in these sort of things to communicate back and forth, was, it's, it's an unnatural state of being. You are, you're an extinct species. Another example, for, or, or was a mythological creature. Well, that probably means that dragons do live somewhere else. Another exam, example, you are a squid, right? Well, you have a real coordination problem because um, you have four appendages and they have 10. And you're gonna have phantom aches in your extra appendages and you're gonna move the wrong body parts at times. It's gonna mess with your neurological system. Ideally, you wanna have a totem that is at least somewhat morphologically similar to you. What if your totem is something completely unimaginable? There's a case of a man who, whose totem is a creature that lives on Sirius, somewhere in the Sirius system, as a completely alien entity. This man is not very happy. It's very hard. And that this creature's morphology is nothing like I've seen on Earth. And of course, these are all more modern phenomenon, right? In a traditional society, none of this would have happened. Traditional society, dinosaur. I mean, there's some stories of some people having a mammoth as their totem, but mammoth is a living animal that lives underground in certain Siberian cultures. And that's okay, that's normal, they're just underground animals. But if your totem animal is on Sirius, you're in for very unpleasant life. And those sorts of things do happen, um, especially in, with our modern cross-cultural cross-pollination. And that's everything I had to say in that. I think David had a couple of things he wanted to say, so I'm gonna mute my microphone. All right, well, we spent several podcasts on shamanism broadly and uh, in closing I'd just like to kind of bring together where where shamanism occurs and where it does not um, I've got five broad groups where it occurs uh, pre prehistoric groups of nomadic hunters and gatherers uh, your paleo peoples um, then hunters and gathering groups that are basically historical, uh, that they were not out-competed by agricultural civilizations, and that's in Australia, the Americas, Africa, and much of Asia. Um, then you have semi-sedentary hunter slash horticulturalist, primitive farmer, prim, prim, they're not even farmers, they're usually like slash and burn agriculturalists. Yeah, um, and, and then you will find shamans among like the uh, uh, the hunting and gathering chiefdoms like the Pacific Northwest uh, tribes. And then finally, and this one may be the most interesting, is the pastoral nomads. Uh, and that's probably, and all these people are either nomadic or they're semi-nomadic. Where you don't find shaman so much is in your later agricultural chiefdoms and in your agricultural civilizations, stratified societies where, um, where you have, you know, peasants, warriors, sure. sure. Hopefully we're not going me on you, are we? 
Um, you know, David, I am going to, on this po last point of where you're doing do not find shamans, I'm going to argue with you, but I'm not going to argue with you right now. Okay. I'm going to argue with you down the road in upcoming podcasts because I would argue that shamanistic tradition and all of these forms of beliefs are well on alive through all of our culture, every single strand of religion that we have today, and that it's something that has never left human psyche, that it's yeah. so essential. It may not be outwardly name that and practice this clearly, but it exists as almost the underlining of all the modern religions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can I... Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's a, new, uh, a site called Chuckaloosa on the banks of the Mississippi. It's a good demonstration of one of these more advanced, um, one of these more advanced chiefdoms that, uh, you see the transformation from shaman to priest um, because there, this is a mound culture. This is a mound culture and the, beside the chief's house is the little temple slash priest house. And then, um, and the difference between a shaman and a priest, this is principally it, is the shamans seek answers for the people. Priests tend to give them in support of a status quo, um, to uphold the, to uphold the, uh, the stratified society. This is cultural evolution slash Marxism, but uh, I, I would just point out that distinction and um, I'm sure we'll hear more about it for too long uh, and, and opposing views i'm done okay uh, there you go. sorry there we go okay okay now sorry guys can you hear me now okay all right so you know i'm not arguing with what you're saying there's we will get to the definition of priest versus shaman so i'm just going to leave it at that there's another slightly slightly different definition that i think is complementary rather than opposing to yours and i just want to finish with an actually kind of a really scary story and i i was going to do it earlier when we were talking about people with uh uh you know their totems being trees but there is a very sad story i believe it's a yakut story of a young girl who was an apple girl her um you know her totem creature was an apple tree, um, fruit bearing apple tree, and she fell in love as a Russian man. And this is like, I don't know, 17th, 18th century story. And it's an actual like native uh, legend. She fell in love as a Russian man who was Christian and she even converted to Christianity, but she did not lose her soul of an apple tree. And they were very much in love and he built them a beautiful house. And at that time, it was Russian cultural tradition that kind of to break in a new house to kind of sanctify a new house it was not a bad idea in russian culture to heat it the first time with an apple with apple wood so one morning while she was still fast asleep you know wanting to surprise her with a new house he went down went out and cut down the first wild apple tree that he could find and of course a couple of hours later when he came home what opened its eyes in his bed was a dead apple tree stuck on a girl's body because the girl was now dead. So yeah, that's kind of a not very happy story, but I, I thought it was pretty intense. I think that's about everything, unless somebody else wants to say something else. Go ahead, Dustin. I just, you know, in typical fashion for me, I save my comments for the end. Um, but going back to fetishes, uh, the way my spirit guide kind of explained it to me is, you know, it, when you have a fetish, it exists in, in, in both worlds. So when it's destroyed, it's destroyed in both worlds. Well, as with anything that has to do with energy, there's ripples that are sent out. And the problem, one of the problems is you don't know who's going to detect those ripples and what's going to, to happen. Yep. Um, but another way that I've used to describe fetishes to, to people who have absolutely no idea what we're talking about is, uh, do you know those little silly friendship necklace things that, that break apart? Yep. It's very similar to that yeah. where 
your spirit has one side or your spirit guide rather has one half of it. You have the other and you, you you know, when you come together, it kind of gets put together and made whole. So I just wanted to share that. Anybody else? I just wanted to shoot something uh, back at David. Um, Also you as well, Julie, but uh, it's, I find that a little bit interesting what you had to say, David, about, um, where you find uh, a shamanistic, uh, you know, tendency wars versus where you do not. And I have found that now I actually agree with Julie that I don't think that this has just gone away from more modern peoples, but I did find it interesting how when I was on the road, um, travelers have a tendency often to practice something that it maybe it's not actually shamanism, but it is very, very similar often. And I, I thought that that was an interesting thing that you said. I never uh, pondered it that way. But yeah, when you have a big, huge town of people that are just locked in the same spot and they're all, you know, basically living in modern culture, they tend to get farther away from the uh, shamanic ways. At least it seems that way. But I don't think that it goes away easily myself. I think that there's more of a resurgence, if anything. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I want to say that, you know, the other thing, well, David, you just did. They, they, I think David's laptop just died, but it's all right. I just have one final comment on this. You know, as far as the, um, as far as the, uh, you know, the societies that are pronouncedly shamanistic versus not pronouncedly shamanistic, this is Mark Wine's theory whom I did not send out a shout to. Guys, I need to send out a shout out to Mervine uh, because I am using a lot of his material and a lot of these lectures inspired by his stuff. But this is a theory specifically put forth by him and I stand by it. And the theory is that um, shame, the, the distribution of actual organized religion versus shamanism is directly correlated to, to locations that were more or less affected by the melting of the ice sheets. In other words, the areas that were least hit climactically by the melting of the ice sheets is where you preserve one version or another of shamanism to where areas that were most affected by, by the climactic changes that resulted in the melting of the, ice, of the ice sheets, where there was absolute upheaval and change in the way of life resulting from those climactic changes. And as a result, the loss of faith and belief in that form of interacting with the other side is where you suddenly have very authoritarian, very um, kind of frame, harsh framed religions arise. And shamans are usually act- and are called witches and so forth and actually prosecuted because people have gone through severe um, trauma of faith and worldview. And that's about everything I really wanted to say on this. All right, so everybody good for next week? We'll start jumping, we're done with the shamanism completely. I'm, I'm done with this part of the series and then we're gonna move into early civilizations and so forth. Thank you, guys. It's always awesome having you on there. I appreciate each and every one of you so very much. All right. See you next Thursday. And before you turn it off. Yeah. Who's talking? I don't know who's talking. Whoever was talking is not talking anymore. Jake, was that you? Jake. Yeah. Yeah, I found a lower hand. What's this lower hand, upper hand, raise hand? It, it, it says, hey, I want to talk. I, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> I'm learning this stuff. I need a 12-year-old. I mean, me too. Uh, Just a piece for that purpose. Yep. Well, like last time, I'm, I, I'm, I'm muted trying to get my picture to come on. and <laughs> That's pretty cool. I, I didn't even notice that, but it's easy to just wave your hand at me. I'm more likely to notice it, honestly. All right, guys. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll let you go. We ran over time today. And um, yeah, I'll upload this as soon as I have the, the subtitles edited. Thanks. Talk to I'm you still soon. learning. Okay, bye. And we're all still learning. Be well. Yeah, sure, forever. See ya. Bye. Good.